Revolutionary Talk for Revolutionary Times. Promoting peace, liberty, and prosperity around the clock. LibertyTalk.fm. Welcome to another edition of Liberty with Love with Robin Kerner. Thank you for being with me today. You know, actually, I suspect this show is coming out on or next to Christmas Day. So if that is the case, happy Christmas to all of you. Um, I hope you've had a good year and I hope you have a year full of even more liberty next year. And I know some of us are holding our breath on that, but we're working on it. We're working on it. And I am speaking to a gentleman today. Um, it's going to be an interesting interview. It's going to be something a little bit different. Uh, I'm speaking to a gentleman who is in Nigeria. He's a Nigerian gentleman who is also the head of programs for students for liberty. And the reason I'm putting him on the show today, and I'm so glad he agreed to do this, is that he wrote an article not too long ago about what the Trump victory in the United States means for his home country of Nigeria. And it made me feel quite ashamed that I've been, you know, doing this show about liberty for three years. And I don't think I've ever spoken to anybody in uh, one of the biggest continents in the world, uh, Africa. And, you know, some of us are so ignorant about that continent. And I was actually, I just have to pick myself off my floor because um, Mayoa, who I'm speaking to today, uh, just told me that it seems that a lot of people think that Africa is a country. And um, I'm hoping my audience is smarter than that. Um, But whether you are or whether you're not... (laughs) You're going to learn something today. I hope so. I hope so. So, um, welcome to the show. Now, I've um, did, I, did I get the name right? Myoa, right? Oh yes, you did, Robin. Thank you very much, and thank you for doing this. It's nine p.m. over there in um, in uh, Nigeria, so I know I'm keeping you up a little bit late. But uh, first of all, thank you for what you do for liberty in Africa. I am guessing, um, well, like the rest of the world, but. Extremely so. Africa really needs a lot of these ideas of liberty and classical liberalism that you're trying to promote over there. Is it like walking through mud up a very steep hill, doing what you do for students for liberty in Africa? It's very difficult to promote the ideas of liberty um, in places like um, the Gambia, for example. Where, if you've been following the things, you know the recent um, developments there. Um, the people of Gambia just voted out um, a, you know, uh, a dictator, and um, and it's refusing to leave. You know, in places like Ethiopia, where um, police routinely beat up our leaders who um, are congregating to have like peaceful meetings. It's it's difficult to promote the ideas of liberty. But many parts of the continent of Africa, um, it's um, it's nothing. It's nothing like promoting freedom, promoting liberty in, in the U.S. Of course, uh, it's, it's a very different ball game. So, is a lot of is a lot of your work actually covert? Do you have to keep under the radar a lot? Um, and how does Nigeria compare to some of the other countries that you are supporting liberty in through Students for Liberty in Africa? Um, it's it's easier to promote the ideas of liberty in Nigeria. For example, since 1999, when uh, we moved away from a military regime to a, to a democracy, um, there has been an increase in um, the levels of freedom of expression, freedom of speech. The media has been relatively free since 1999. We've enjoyed um, relative freedom since since we um, since we moved away from a military. Um, Government to, to a democracy, but that, that's 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 not the um, same experience across the continent. Sure, um, we've had our leaders targeted and jailed in Gambia. We've had um, some of our leaders had to we had to pull out some of lead, some of our leaders in the Gambia. We had to rescue them and um, sort of bring them to you know a more stable place um, because they were persecuted by the government in, in Ethiopia. 
uh, some of our leaders have been beaten up by police for just having meetings and finding flyers and materials that promote the ideas of individual liberty on them, on their, on their person. So it's, um, you know, it's, uh, it's very difficult to promote li- the ideas of liberty in certain places. It can be dangerous in certain places. Um, in South Africa, it's difficult to promote the ideas of liberty because many of the young people there are simply, are sim- have simply sold, are, are simply sold to the left. Yes. You know, the, the, the Marxism, the, 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 um, the ideas of Marxism seem to resonate amongst the young people in South Africa. Um, so each country has its different um, peculiarities. And we try to work with the students on the ground who understand who understand their local the dynamic of their, mm-hmm. their politics. They understand their local environments to craft our strategy for promoting liberty in their different countries. Um, I'm British, as you can tell from my accent, Myla. So I've got a question I'm interested to ask you. Is there any general difference between the current experience and your work in countries that were formerly colonized by the British and those who were formerly colonized by the French and maybe other powers? Um, I'll say that the, the experience of colonialism across the board was negative. Um, whether it was um, we were colonized by the French or by the British, um, the experience was um, negative across the board. But that said, it seems as if countries that were colonized by the French, um, because of the tactics of the French, you know, uh, was, more, was more brutal. Um, it seems that countries like that, Francophone Africa, seem to you know, seem not to have recovered as fast as um, um, Anglophone Africa. And for whatever reason, um, one continues to see that trend um, amongst, um, amongst you know, so that, that level of, um, uh, that, the, the, that level of uh, the fact that, that their people have not, they have not healed. Yes. Uh, they're not yet, they're not yet, they're still, they're still, um, we live in the past in, in many of Francophone Africa. Um, you also find that many other many Francophone African countries are still still have this bond, this whole, some form of colonial bond to France um, that you don't see you don't see in um, in, in Anglophone Africa. But one of the reasons I asked that question is because um, a lot of us who are kind of interested in liberty in the Anglo tradition. Um, you know, we make a lot about, mm-hmm. make a lot of common law um, and the contrast between law coming up from the people in uh, the Anglo sphere, um, uh, whereas mm-hmm. you, you mentioned France, obviously. Um, you know, Fr- France has been traditionally much more statist, much more top down, um, mm-hmm. having the Napoleonic yeah. Code. Um, are those differences, are those differences in traditions evident? in the countries uh, in Africa, even now, do they bear on your ability to sell the ideas of liberty into the different nations, or not really? Um, I, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think so. Um, for example, after independence, many African countries, you know, did away with the common law. For example, in Nigeria, we just accepted, adopted um, the American system. Um, you know, into our uh, kind of those adopted it and you know, with, with minor minor revisions here and there. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I don't really think that um, that's that has that has had so many um, that has had so that has affected the way people behave so much. Mm-hmm. But but I but I think that like I mentioned, I think that because the um, francophone. Um, Francophone Africa were were oppressed in a much greater level than Anglophone Africa. They, they they seem to they seem to relieve that past more more than than, than um, English speaking African countries. That that is that is absolutely uh, absolutely fascinating. Now, do you in your role as um, head of programs for Students for Liberty in all of Africa, which is a lot of countries? I mean, that's one hell of a position to be in. Do you do you travel across Africa a lot? Across the continent, or are you are you working from Nigeria primarily? I I travel I travel a lot across the continent of Africa. Um, we we're currently in eighteen African countries. We have leaders okay. on the ground 
boots on the ground in these different countries. Um, so that means that I travel extensively across the continent to you know meet some of our leaders in places like South Africa, Tanzania, Kenya, to um, try to get the message of, our, of liberty out there. I love it. I love it. I think and we're gonna we've only got a. Uh... I don't know, three quarters of a minute uh, before we're going into the first break. Um, but now, as I said, I said at the top of the show, uh, I think, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is because you wrote this article about uh, what Trump's um, election in the US means uh, for Nigeria. And I am interested more generally as in how the West, and in particular the United States, that likes to think of itself sometimes as a beacon of freedom, um, looks right now to the rest of the world. Because I think the, uh, that phrase, beacon of freedom, uh, might need to be said with the tongue very firmly put in the cheek uh, these days. So we'll be coming back after the break, and we will discuss that. This is Liberty With Love. I'm Robin Kerner. This is LibertyTalk.fm. <laughs> I'm Robin Kerner. This is Liberty With Love. And I'm speaking to the head of programs for Students for Liberty across the entire continent of Africa. Um, I just think that's such a huge, huge remit. I, I, I can hardly get over it. Um, so, Mayowa, uh America, the land of the free, the home of the brave, the shining city on the hill and all of that. Um, how does the West look generally to... Uh, this seems like such an absurd question to ask, but how does the West look generally to um, folks in Africa? What I'm trying to get at is primarily, do Africans see the West and see a world of hypocrites? Or do they see something to aspire to? Or do they see both? Or do they see neither? Uh, well, it depends on where exactly you call the West. So I'm assuming that you, by, by the West, you, 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 know, you mean the United States mostly. Um, and maybe, so, yeah, you know what? And if, if, Af- if you as an African have a very different view, let's say, of the United States and let us say Europe, I would be very fascinated by that. So maybe we can talk about that. But yes, let's indeed start with the US. Great place to start. Let's go. Yeah, sure. Um, so f- first and foremost, the U.S. Uh, and you know, most of um, many other countries that you call the West um, have certain institutions that many African countries don't have. You know, that made African the countries what? Sorry, free speech. Say sorry, that, I, I didn't hear you quite clearly there. You said yeah. that in the U.S. we have certain institutions that. Oh yeah, so I said many. You know, the U.S. and many many other countries that you classify as um, as the West have you know, certain institutions that many African countries don't have. The institutions such as um, the rule of law, um, freedom of expression, free speech, um, free speech um, you know, a, a, an independent press. You know, these, these things, these things as nuanced as they may seem, uh, you know, are, are, are indices to measure you know, you know, how free society, how free society is. So if you have if you, and, and this is many, these are the things that many Africans look up to. Many Africans want in their countries. They want to be able to speak freely without government persecution. They want to be able to move freely across, you know, um, across from one region to the other without, without government um, imposing, imposing restrictions on them. Um, they want to be able to, to, you know, the media wants, the journalists want to be able to report what's going on. Um, without without the fear of the government clamping clamping down on them, um, so when when many Africans look to the West, these are the things, these are institutions that they wish they wish existed in their own countries. They wish that these things exist, you know. But but unfortunately, it's not the case. Um, so so I wouldn't want to, well some somehow speak for for I can't speak for all of, all of Africa. Sure. But but to a certain extent, I believe that many Africans look to the West and, and, and see these institutions that exist and hope that these institutions one day will exist in their own different countries. So if they, all, if they see that, um, does that not make it easier to sell the ideas of liberty? Because you can say, look, these things that you like, that you already like before you even met me, <laughs> they're in this book here by mm-hmm. Bastiat. They're in this, they're these ideas of Hayek, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You know, they're not in this, these books by Marx they're, or by Chairman mm-hmm. Mao, you know. Um, is, yeah. that, is that something that you can, and I mean this in the best way, exploit when you're trying to sell the ideas of liberty? Or is there a disconnect? 
So you see, it's, it's easier to sell these ideas to younger people. You know, guys my age understand the importance of the rule of law. They understand the importance of free speech and, you know, and, and, and the ideas of liberty generally. So you'd find that the ideas of liberty resonate mostly amongst young people. Hmm. But it's a different case when you talk to the older generation. A Ghanaian professor in the U.S. Um, who, who, who is, who's called um, uh, Professor George Ayite, you know, says that it's a class war, it's a, it's a war, it's a war between the hippos and the cheetahs. And he says that the cheetahs are the younger generation. Okay. And the hippos are the, are the old, old guys in politics who have run things for decades and don't want change. And, and, that's, and that's, that's the truth. So when you talk about the ideas of liberty, people my age understand the importance of, um, of, of, of these institutions existing on the continent of Africa. But when you talk to, when you talk to politicians, when you talk to the guys who, who have been in power for so long, they don't understand. Or either they understand, but they are selfish and don't want you know, that change to happen. What about the older, regular people in countries like Nigeria? Do they support those selfish, old hippopotamus uh, politicians? Do they, the elder people, the regular folks, want to keep things as they are? I mean, um, because maybe they can't imagine this new world of liberty. Maybe the responsibility that comes with that frightens them. Or maybe they want liberty too. I mean, why would that be something that only the young would want? Where do they stand? No, so there are quite a number of uh, you know older folks who understand the importance of free markets, um, mm-hmm. individual liberty, and, and and freedom generally. But the willpower to change the political system doesn't. It's not there. Mm. It's one thing for you to understand the importance of this of these institutions, the institutions of free, of 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 of, of the rule of law, free markets, and things like that. It's another thing to to have enough willpower to change the system. Yes. Um. So. It seems as if when it gets to a point, because it's so difficult to change the system, many people are sucked in. So they know they know what is right. They know what should exist. They know what change we want we want to see, but because there's no there's not enough willpower to change mm-hmm. the system, um, we're just left with the status quo. So, if- so that's why at students for what we're trying to do is reach out to the younger folks and try to get them, you know, to be more politically active. To be more, you know, to to be to to to, to you know to to clamour for this change that we want. So it sounds then that your work is more, as you say, trying to generate the motivation, and less actually having an ideological battle with socialism, for example. Um. So it's it, it's a bit of both. It's a bit is a bit of you know okay. um, sustaining the motivations among the young people. It's also a bit of educating them. So it's one thing for you to know, you know, have a rough idea of, you know, what sort of change that you want to see. It's another thing for you to be able to articulate change, you know. Are we, I should be taking to get to that change. So one of the things that we do. Sorry. No, I, uh, your, your connection just, uh, I lost you there for a few seconds, but you're back now. My error, so you just oh, carry on. Yeah, carry oh, yeah, on. Sorry. No worries. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, so, so yeah. So what? What I mean is this, it's one thing for you to understand what change you want to see, uh, have a rough idea of what you want to see. It's another thing for you to be educated enough to articulate the ideas and the steps that you should take, we should take to achieve that change. So what we do is, 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 is not only to identify the you know, young people who, who, believe, who believe in freedom, who believe in liberty, we also, it's also a role to educate them, give them the resources yes. that they need. Because they need resources, you know, to advance the ideas of liberty. You know, they need books, they need access to, you know, grants, you know, and uh, materials that they need to advance the ideas of liberty. So right. while, while, while many of them can articulate, you know, roughly articulate the ideas of liberty and, uh, and, 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 and the steps that we should take to achieve freedom in the different countries, what we're doing, we're arming them, we're giving them mm-hmm. access to, you know, the resources that they need, you know, to, to advance that, you know, the ideas of liberty. Um, now we've only got a minute left in this second segment, but let me ask you this question. Obviously, it's clear to understand and clear to see the attraction of liberty for its own sake. Is the connection between liberty and prosperity easy, easily seen among the people you, people you deal with? Yes, because, you see, if it, it takes just 
it takes a curious person to look at the data. Mm. Liberty, free markets have brought people, more people out of poverty, you know, on the continent of Africa than any other economic system. Mm. So once, once you identify that, once you see that, it's everything, everything falls in place. Yes. Okay, great. This, uh, this um, hour is going very fast. We're coming up to the end of the second segment. Uh, I'm Robin Kerner. This is Liberty With Love on libertytalk.fm. And I am speaking to Mayoa, who is the head of programs for Students for Liberty across the entire great continent of Africa. We're going into the break. We will be back in just a few minutes. <laughs> In 2011, Robin Kerner wrote the article that launched the biggest coalition for Ron Paul's presidential run called Blue Republican. Now, Stairway Press is pleased to announce the publication of his first book, If You Can Keep It, Why We Nearly Lost It and How We Get It Back. Jeffrey Tucker, who wrote the foreword, says brilliant ideas come in effervescent packages. This is a good description of Robin Kerner's provocative work. It's a work of stunning erudition and sincerity. I also happen to agree with it. I've been struggling toward a similar thesis for a good part of my writing career, though I'm certain Robin has gone beyond even my most mature thought. His section on liberty as a realization of a civilization of love truly sweeps me away with its insight and depth. I know that time is short and that people don't read as carefully as they should, but this section deserves close study by every advocate of liberty it will change the way you think and speak about the topic we need this book now pre-order your personally signed copy of if you can keep it at if you can keep it dot us So I'd like to pivot a bit now and talk uh, more directly about the relationship between uh, your country, my, uh, uh, Nigeria, and uh, the United States, other countries in the West, um, and perhaps with particular relation to trade relationships and foreign aid. Um, foreign aid is a kind of a virtue signaling political issue across a lot of Western countries. And I know, um, you know, you hear some folks in Africa uh, who say that it's important, there should be more of it. And then there are other folks who write great books that say, please stop helping us, it's killing us. Um, let me talk to you as obviously someone who understands liberty and where prosperity comes from and who is engaged in this stuff. Tell me about the relationship. Let's start with Nigeria. What is the relationship between Nigeria and, again, as we can start with the United States? How do you relate as a country to the U.S. as a country? I mean, so, like, like you mentioned, the relationship can be, you know, comes two, two different ways, in the trade as well as foreign aid. Um, so, as you already know, my, my arguments for, you know, for more relationship between the United States and Nigeria will be for trade, and how both countries can benefit, uh, mutually benefit from, from, from trade. Um, in, in that article I wrote about, um, about um, how Trump's president would affect um, crude oil and, 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 and all of that, um, being one of being Nigeria's major exports. Um, but I'd, I'd like to briefly talk about, about foreign aid. And, and, and it, seems, it seems that many people get it wrong. Many people or many Africans who, 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 who clamor for um, the sustaining of, for, of, of foreign aid from the United States get it wrong. What, what we've seen over the last over, over the last few decades, is an import of billions of dollars on the con into the continent of Africa um, that has done absolutely nothing. I have not seen any country that has become prosperous from foreign aid. None, not one. And um, and it seems as if those who those who you know those who say that free you know free trade or trade with the West and all of these things, are, you know, it's 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 a new it's, it's a new form of colonialism wrong because. Foreign aid is a perpetration of colonialism. It's like an extension of colonialism. This is what happens when when the U.S. gives money um, to, to to corrupt governments in Africa. Um, it, it means that when 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 the United States gives, um, say, the Gambia or gives a, you know gives governments in Africa uh, you know free money, they are they are they are they are taking you know what happens is that governments who are supposed to be um, Accountable to their people, then, then don't become accountable to them. You know, in, in, in situations where governments, people pay taxes to the government, and therefore the government, government becomes accountable. Government is accountable to to taxpayers, and taxpayers hold the government. You know, um, you know, hold them to 
to account for, for things they're supposed to do. When, when those government receive, when they receive foreign aid from the United States, there, there, there's no incentive. Mm-hmm. There's no incentive to be accountable to, to their people. Then they become accountable to, you know, whoever is signing the checks or sending them the money. Um, there's, there's a story that was told by, um, by a farmer in, uh, in, in, in East Africa in a, in a documentary run by, um, by Acton Institute. So the Acton Institute is based in the United States, but they have a, they have a, they have a, a, a program called Poverty Cure that, that sort of looks at how poverty, how entrepreneurship is a solution for poverty across around the world. And he said this, he said in his little farm um, somewhere in East Africa, um, a government a, a government project funded by funded by um, foreign aid um, decided to decided to um, supply eggs, tons of eggs, like thousands of eggs to to this this particular village every year, and they did that for a couple of years. What that did was it distorted the local market for eggs, uh, for poultry guys who had invi- who had invested in um, poultry farms mm-hmm. who were starting a budging poultry business went out of business because these free eggs funded by foreign money distorted the market and, um, and, 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 and local entrepreneurs lost. Now, when, 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 the, when the project was, um, was over and, um, and governments were not, and, 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 the, and the project was not sending eggs to the local farm, to the local populace, there was no, there was no, there was no, um, there was no farm to, pro- to provide eggs for the people, and and there were no free eggs coming from anywhere. Yeah. So what that meant was that I'm I'm, I'm just saying this to to illustrate how yeah our foreign aid comes distorts the market and everyone is everyone loses. So it's it's important that young people and many young people are saying this that uh, it's important that entrepreneurship thrives and they are more reliant. Young people are more reliant on on on, on themselves starting their own businesses, running their own businesses and, and, and growing these businesses rather than rely rely on the government for um for 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 for, 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 for handouts. And do you think that a large proportion, especially of the younger generation, can see the kind of damage that you're talking about there? Are they able to look around and see empirically that this isn't working? Or or again is that a hard sell? Many 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 young people are seeing this. But at the same time, you should also you should also know that um, our educational systems have been damaged. Have been damaged beyond re- well, I wouldn't say beyond re- but have been dam- damaged extensively. After independence of many African countries, after independence, especially Nigeria, I would say Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya. After independence, the the guys who fought for independence um, from 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 the colonial masters thought there was a conflation between. Capitalism and colonialism. In their mind, mm. they thought that if, 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 okay. if, if the colonial masters were were for profit, if they were, if they, if they, if they came, if um, colonialism was about exploitation and was about profit making, therefore, capitalism and colonialism was the one and the same. Mm. So when they started enacting policies after after independence, they started enacting policies that were that were that were against free markets, that were anti. Capitalist. The first set of uh, thinkers that that came out of that of the revolutions that we had across the continent, unfortunately, happened to happen to be from the left. Happened to be sympathetic to to the left. So we have Julius Nyerere in Tanzania. We have Obafemi Awolowo in Nigeria, and tons, you know, lots of other you know thinkers across the continent who were sympathetic towards towards the left. What that did was that. The professors that we have, that we have in our institutions, the books that we are, that were that went that they, that they stocked libraries with, you know, the ideas that circulated were ideas that were antagonistic towards capitalism. Yes. So when you talk to many many Africans, many many Africans, you find out that the default idea, the default notion, is that the government's role. Is to take care of everybody. It's the government's role is to fix the roads. The government's role is to take care of uh, hospitals and, 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 and welfare. So it, it, it has become really difficult to sell the ideas of liberty because the founding fathers, unfortunately for us, your founding fathers 
you know, were more sympathetic towards liberty, founding fathers were more sympathetic towards the left. Yes. And um, and, and and government control. So it 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 takes a lot of reorientation, you know, to get people to understand, you know, simple economics mm. because you know the the damage was not done yesterday. The damage has been done for decades. Now, this makes me think of uh, something else that seems to be um, a huge phenomenon in Africa right now, talking about colonialism, which is um, the massive influx of Chinese investment, right, across parts of the continent. Um, And I know some folks in the West are kind of very worried watching this big Chinese takeover of of of, uh, huge um, amounts of African resources, this Chinese toehold in Africa. Um, is there, is the Chinese presence in Africa um, contributing to uh, leftist ideas in Africa? Is it facilitated by leftist ideas in Africa? Is it changing the trajectory of the continent of Africa? Or is this really not as big a story as I might think it is? Well, I, th- I think the way the Chinese are coming into the continent is a little different. Um, and if, the fact that the, Ch- the Chinese are, are coming into trade. So many people see the Chinese as, they welcome the Chinese because the Chinese are coming into trade. Except in instances where the Chinese are giving money or are giving, you know, aid to, um, to, to dictators, you know. Okay. You see, the difference between aid from the West is that when, when the Western world gives aid to Africa, they, they are strings attached. The West would say, if we give you X amount of money, you need to reform your, this particular institution. You need to improve on the rule of law. You need to, you need to, you need to improve on X or Y or Z. You know? mm-hmm. Th- there's, there's always a string attached to whatever, whatever aid the West gives. When China gives money, China gives money without strings. They give money mm-hmm. to dictators. They build the African Union. Uh, they, 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 they build... They spend billions of dollars on the continent without no, without any strings attached. So, in that sense, you know, they are not. There's no incentive on the part of you know African governments to reform mm. because China doesn't care about that. China, China wants to spend this money and go go away with whatever they want. Um, but in certain instances, you'll see that you know uh, China focuses on infrastructure on the continent of Africa. And because they are focusing a lot on infrastructure, on rail, on 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 on, on, on rail, rail lines, on um, construction, um, con- constructing roads, on on, on 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 constructing bridges, people seem really sympathetic towards China and and seem to welcome them. Do you see um, what do you see behind the Chinese motivation? Is it purely is it purely trade and profit? Um, is it is it fair trade? Is it trade on a level playing field, or are they um, are they in a position? Maybe you might say the position of an economic colon, uh, colonist. Well, I I, I don't I don't believe in I don't believe in economic colonialism in the sense okay. that they 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 give you know when 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 they come to Africa. The strike a deal with our government, right. irrespective of you know, we can argue about if our governments have the right to, you know, have the right to um, to negotiate with China in regards to you know resources that belong to us and, and, and whatever. But they had a negotiation, and you know, China 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 came with its own um, proposition mm-hmm. that seemed okay by our governments, uh, and you know, so so I, I don't really buy the idea of. Um, of, of this arrangement being um, economic um, colonialism or whatever, you know. Right. But, but what I see is that the Chinese seem to be more important in the economics, you know. Um, they are not propagating, they are not propagating, you know, China's communism, you know, alongside, alongside, okay. um, alongside whatever they're doing. They're coming here to do strictly business. And that's why people seem, um, people seem to, to be more sympathetic towards them because they think that they are here to do business and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. That, that's great. That's a direct answer to a direct question. I appreciate it. <clears throat> okay. So uh, now let's see. We've got a few minutes left in this show. Um, 
that article that you wrote, you were you were motivated to write that by Trump's victory. Um, so what's the feeling in Nigeria about Trump's victory a long way away, you know, on the other side of the Atlantic? Does it really <laughs> matter? Does it really matter? I mean, you know, I've got to say around the world, um, you know, I travel in Europe a lot. <clears throat> you know, everybody's looking at what's been going on in America politically like it's some reality TV show. And I kind of joke that, you know, now all of America is living in the biggest reality TV show on Earth, um, you know, run by a reality TV star, no less. Uh, but how does it look to how does it look to, um, to, uh, to you know, from Africa? I think the, the the biggest the biggest aspect of um, Trump's winning that that many Afri- many Nigerians are are interested in uh, in finding out is um, how his immigration policies will pan out. Um, what's what what is um he, he said numerous times that um, he plans to send back um, um to to deport as many illegal illegal immigrants in in the U.S. as possible. Um, so many many Nigerians are worried that um, this might affect um, quite a number of Nigerians in in the U.S. and also affect um, America's policy towards um, welcoming welcoming migrants. Um, but sincerely, I don't I don't really see much difference from Obama administration has deported at least 2.5 million people over the course of his tenure. And um, and it's been one of the has been the highest, I believe, the highest. Um, uh, the president who has deported the highest number of people so far. Um, so I, I, Trump, whatever Trump does, um, if Trump beats Obama, it's not going to be a by by a very large margin. <laughs> and I doubt that Trump can deport, you know, eleven million people. You know, I don't think that eleven million people will be airing on. Immigration reg- regulations in the U.S. Um, that's 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 just not feasible. Um, but I don't see the difference. Obama, Trump. I mean, mm. Obama's deported 2.5 million people, so I, I I don't expect much from 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 Trump as well. But but that's the sentiment. General sentiment is that um um immigration policy, America's immigration policy, may change significantly and may be un- unwelcoming to. To, um, to 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 Nigerians and Africans generally. Aside from aside from Trump's policies, the impact of direct impact of Trump's policies, you know, the sentiment that um, Trump's racist uh, you know statements may have spurred um, the the alternative rights movement in Africa in South Africa. In, in, I'm sorry, in, in the United States, and um, and how people are reacting. To, people are worried. Many. Many Africans, many Nigerians are worried okay. uh, about that. Okay, this is very interesting. Um, to see ourselves as others see us is always a very interesting and valuable thing. We are going into the last break here. So thanks so much for spending this uh, time with us here on Liberty with Love, Maya. I appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Um, so we just as we close out the show, thanks, we've, got, we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, just qu- real quick, what programs are you actually working on right now? Um, and uh, where can people go to find out about them? Oh, yes. Um, we, we're working on what we call the Liber- Liberty in Africa course. It's an online course for um, students across the continent who are interested in understanding the ideas of liberty. And um, that will be live, will go live very soon. Um, but for those who are interested in finding out more about African Students for Liberty, um, you can check out our website at asfl.info, asfl.info. So you'll find out about all the programs we run, conferences that we run on the continent, our leadership training programs, the Students for Liberty Academy, and, and all, of, all of that wonderful stuff we do across the continent of Africa. And which countries would you say that uh, African Students for Liberty is strongest in right now? Um, so we were strongest in Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, um, Tanzania, okay. and um, we have a lot of work going on in South Africa, Mozambique, and um, quite a number of um, other East African countries. Okay. Now, are you going to be at the International Students for Liberty event in D.C.? Yeah, hopefully I should be there. All right. So I hope to meet you there. And then I will be able to thank you in person for giving me this hour of your time this evening. Um, I say this evening, meaning your evening. Of course, it's not my evening, but um, <laughs> I, I appreciate it. And I've, you, know, I, you know what? I'm just going to plug International Students for Liberty. It's an amazing event. Um, it's the United Nations of 
liberty, if you like. It's a couple of thousand people <laughs> were, the, were, the, were the last couple of thousand people at the last one. Um, I've been to the last two or three. Uh, <clears throat> it's great. You'll meet wonderful people um, like Mayoa who are doing. Um, I keep saying Mayoa. It's Mayoa. I think I keep getting the emphasis wrong. And you're being so generous by not correcting me. Um, you know, who really are making a difference around the world for the ideas that we care about. Um, so, yes, yeah, you should all be checking out Students for Liberty. Uh, and they, get, they put out great resources, some of them freely available. Um, <clears throat> so check them out. Thank you again. Uh, this is Liberty with Love. I'm Robin Kerner. This is LibertyTalk.fm. Check out the past shows on the archives at LibertyTalk.fm. And again, if you're listening to this around Christmas time, happy Christmas. Thank you. Revolutionary talk for revolutionary times. Promoting peace, liberty, and prosperity around the clock. LibertyTalk.fm.